take your Bible this evening and uh, just start at Romans 12. Well, you, we're going to end up in Philippians, as you see on your paper, probably, if you have the sh- Bible study sheet to fill out. But we're going to start in Romans, and we're going to look at some other scriptures heading into the book of Philippians, all right? And you get to Romans, and start in Romans 12, all right? Romans 12. Let's pray, shall we? Father, bless our time together tonight and honor the study of your word here as we seek to study to show ourselves approved unto God. I pray that you would open our understanding as we look into your word. I pray, Holy Spirit, you'd be our teacher. Help me, Lord, to have clarity. Help me to get across, Lord, the truth as you would have us to understand it. And Lord, help us all to be of the same mind. In Jesus' name, amen. Be of the same mind. Look at Romans 12 and verse number 16. Notice the Bible says, Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. So be of the same mind one to another. Now, keep going to your right, and you'll find 1 Corinthians. And 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Notice 1 Corinthians 1. And verse number 10, the Bible says, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. The same mind. Now, keep going to 2 Corinthians. Towards the end of 2 Corinthians, the last chapter, chapter 13. 2 Corinthians and chapter 13. Notice with me verse number 11, where Paul writes, Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Then keep going to your right. We'll come back to the book of Philippians. Just pass that to 1 Peter. Would you go to 1 Peter? Go past Hebrews and James, and then you'll see 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Notice verse number 8. Here Peter writes, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Notice 1 Peter 4 and verse 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. Now, look at the book of Philippians. You're going to notice, and and actually in every chapter in the book of Philippians, Paul deals with his subject. He starts in chapter 1 and verse 27. When he says, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. In chapter 2 and verse number 2, he says, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Again in chapter 4 and verse 2 of Philippians, he says, I beseech Iodius and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And, and he mentions this in every chapter in the book of Philippians. Now, in Philippians 2, notice verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, we're going to look tonight about that phrase, being of the same mind. That's an interesting uh, 
interesting word, an interesting command that the Lord has. And I think, listen, unity is important. And the way you get unity in the family of God and in the church of God is for everybody to be of the same mind. And, and, and that means nothing's done through strife or vainglory, but we all can have the mind of Christ. And we're going to talk about how to get the same mind. And here's the motivation. When you talk about having the same mind or uh, having unity in the church, you know, how do we get it? How does that happen? How can we all have the same mind? What, what is the motivation for us to have the same mind? And in, ver in chapter 2, if you notice, it says, If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit. And the, the word, if, it, it's, it's very similar here to, if you remember in Colossians chapter 3, it says, If ye then be risen with Christ, or if Christ be risen, it's not, it's not, if it's happened, it's, it's like it's rhetorical almost, like absolutely it's happened. Uh, in other words, if you're here tonight, you might as well listen. Now, I don't mean are you here or not. You're here. I'm looking at you. All right? It, it's We would say almost because you're here. All right? And you could say, well, because there's consolation in Christ, because there's comfort of the love, because of the fellowship of the Spirit, because of the bowels and the mercies, fulfill you my joy that you be like-minded. And there we get it, we're getting into the why would we want to be of the same mind? Why would we want to have unity? Well, here's some motivations. Number one is the consolation that we have in Christ. The word consolation is the same word we get our word encouragement. Because of the encouragement we get in Christ. Uh, Christ, hey, Christ has encouraged each one of us. Christ has helped each one of us. Christ has, has, has faithfully come alongside us and helped us and enabled us and strengthened us and, and been there for us. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. That's Jesus Christ. He's always there. And because of what Christ has done in my life, past and present, and what I believe He'll do in the future, see, that ought to encourage me to want to be of the same mind because, listen, Christ loved me and gave Himself for me. And, and if He loved you and gave Himself for you, that ought to be a motivation. When Paul was serving Christ, you know what he said? It's the love of Christ that constrains me. That's what motivates me, is what Christ and his love for me. He which hath begun a good work in us will perform it until the day of Christ. And so our motivation is the encouragement we have in Christ. But then he said, it's also comfort of love. Any comfort of love. So he follows up, not only with the encouragement Christ gives, but the, the love, the mercy, the tenderness, the sympathy, the grace, the forgiveness, that all of that we've received from Christ, that ought to encourage us to be of the same mind, to be able to be unified together. I'm going to talk about being in the same mind and just exactly what that means in just a minute. I just want to talk about the motivations. And this is what Paul is talking to the church at Philippi about. And, and he's simply saying, uh, if you receive so much from Christ, couldn't you take some of that and give it to other people? Couldn't you pass that along to one another? And didn't Jesus pray for it in John 17? Didn't he pray that they might be one, even as the Father and I are one? That we would all uh, be of the same mind? When in view of what Christ has done for us and all that he's doing in us and through it, we, he said, listen, th th then couldn't you give the Lord what he's asking for. And that is that we be one, that we have the same mind, that we can have the same attitude one toward another that he has toward us. You see, when we have disunity, or if you have a bitter spirit, or, or if, you, if you have uh, something where you just don't want to get along with people, and there's some people who get that way, who like the, it's like they're not happy unless they're arguing with somebody. You know what I mean? And I mean, if they don't have a fight going on, they're going to pick one. That's just kind of, and, and listen, God says, you, you have to understand, when, when you get that, that way, it is 
It is a sin against Christ and what He's done for us. It is a sin against a relationship, not a code of conduct. When he says, be of the same mind, it has something to do with our relationship with Christ in light of what Christ has done for us and what he's doing in us. If any consolation, if there's any encouragement, if there's any comfort of love, then it's a sin against Christ and what his desire is for us. So we understand that's a motivation. But wait, he doesn't stop there. He says then, the fellowship of the Spirit. The Spirit who dwells within us. This Holy Spirit who regenerated us. The Holy Spirit of God who sanctifies us. The Holy Spirit of God who gives us gifts. The Holy Spirit of God who seals us, who enables us, who intercedes for us, who fills us. You see, the Holy Spirit of God who strengthens us to resist temptation. The Holy Spirit of God who provides us the power to witness and give the gospel to others. Because of all that the Holy Spirit does for us. The fellowship of the Spirit. And then he says, in the bowels and the mercies. That is the, 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 it's the way we would say affections and and, and compassion. We don't use those terms, bowels and mercies. But but Paul said, I long after you in the bowels. It's, It's your feelings. It's your innermost feelings. He says, the Spirit not only gives us power, but He gives us sympathy as well. The Holy Spirit of God not only gives us the ability to serve Him, but He gives us that tender heart so we can be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. There's no need for the Christian to be harsh with another Christian, to be be, uh, angry and, and upset with another believer. It's the Spirit who longs for unity of believers and unity in the church. Remember uh, uh, Ephesians 4 and verse 3, uh, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. It's the unity of the Spirit. The Spirit desires that, that, that fellowship together. And so can we really say to the Holy Spirit, well, I take everything you want to do for me. I take everything you have for me, but I'm not passing on to anybody. I'm just going to receive, but not give anything that you give to me and pass it on. No, we, we can't say I'll take it all and give nothing in return. I want to, if I don't, listen, if I do that and I keep it to myself and I don't extend that grace and that mercy and that forgiveness and that tenderness to others, you know what I'm doing? I'm quenching the Spirit. Because the Spirit would have us to get along. The Spirit would have us be of the same mind. So because of my gratitude and love for Jesus Christ, because of my gratitude and love for the Spirit, because of what they have done and they are doing in my life, I want to be of the same mind. I want to fulfill my joy. Paul said, it's great joy to me and it's great joy to the Spirit and to the Lord that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. Now, when we think of that term, be of the same mind, I'm going to tell you what it means. You know what it means? It means to think the same way. To think the same way. <clears throat> A key to unity is to think alike. Now how in the world is that going to happen? You have to be able to think the same thoughts. I want you to go back with me. Hold your finger there in Philippians uh, we're going to come back to Philippians, but I want you to look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 again. Now, 1 Corinthians 1, right off the bat, Paul has to deal with division in the church. This was uh, what, what he called a, a division, a schism, if you will. They were divided. They had different factions in the church. And, and they were divided over preachers. They were divided over personalities, okay? And Paul said, what did Paul tell them in chapter 3? I can't speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. Carnal meaning you're in the flesh. As babies in Christ. He said, I would have liked to have given you uh, something stronger and talk to you as spiritual, but I couldn't. 
So he tells them in verse 10 that we read earlier, I want you to be joined, perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. It's an amazing statement. You say, you mean he's asking the church to agree? Yeah. <laughs> Imagine that. I know. Uh, people say, what do you get when you put 100 people in a room, everybody with a different opinion? And the answer is, you get a Baptist church. Okay? I understand that. But, but Paul here is admonishing them to all agree, to all think the same way, to think and have the same judgment. No divisions, same mind, same judgment. And he said, it's sad that you're divided and so quarrelsome. And, it's, and we read it over and over again where the Scripture repeats it, that we're to be of the same mind. And we're to be like-minded. And we're to, we're to be together and means we think the same way. Unity comes when believers think alike. Now stay with me. Don't, don't, don't throw tomatoes at me yet. He's not talking about doctrine. In Philippians, he's not talking about doctrine. There was no doctrinal problem in Philippi. It was a great church. But he urges them about being of the same mind. He urges them to be like-minded. He urges them to think alike. We're all here in the room, and, and listen, we could all, I could, I could list the doctrines of the Bible, which is the doctrines of Bible Baptist Church, and have you all sign it. It doesn't mean we're all thinking alike. It simply means we all agree doctrinally. Most, when there's problems in churches, most divisions and, and schisms and factions in a church are not over doctrine. They're over other petty things. People, people have split church over, uh, I read one, one church, because a fellow going through a potluck meal after a service on a Sunday morning, Brother Yoder, uh, a young person, a teenage boy, got more on his plate than this guy felt he got on his, and he caused a big stir and split the church. No kidding. People split over shingles on the church. Bob and I were talking, there's a church up north where the pastor went on Facebook and they're getting new chairs in their auditorium and he, he's getting everybody vote on Facebook, chair one, chair two, chair three, or chair four. I said, that guy's nuts, man. I said, man, you're asking for, for split city there. People will split over whether you got their chair they wanted or not. It's, it's unbelievable. So he's not talking about doctrine here. He's talking about thinking alike. How, how can we think alike? That that's almost sounds like that's, that's a little weird, but that's what God's calling us to do. What does that mean? What does it mean to think alike? What does it mean to be of the same mind? Here's what it is. Four things, I think. Number one, have the same attitude. It means have the same attitude. The same mindset. The same disposition. That's what I think he's referring to in Philippians 2.5 when he says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Because he goes on to say, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. All that's talking about his disposition. Talk about what the Lord's attitude when he came to earth. He didn't come lording over the fact, I'm God, you're not. He made himself of no reputation. And he took upon him the form of a servant. It's all about his disposition. And so that's what he means when, when he says, you, you put your mind, have that mindset, have that disposition. Notice in Philippians chapter 3. Are you in Philippians? Philippians chapter 3, look at verse 19. Well, verse 18. Paul says here, For many walk, of whom I have told you often and now tell you in weeping, they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. So who is Paul talking about right here? The enemies of the cross of Christ, okay? All right? Uh, would not be the people we'd want to hang around, okay? And notice his description. Whose end is destruction, 
whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who do what? Mind earthly things. Where's their mind? On earthly things. It's, in other words, their mind is controlled by this world system. Their mind is influenced and controlled by what they see here on this earth. We're talking about a disposition. We're talking about an attitude. We're talking about a, a common thinking pattern. And you're not going to get that. You're not going to get everyone to think the same. You're not going to get that commonality by human means. Don't we see that in our country? All kinds of appeals since the election in November to come together. Let's just, we need to unify the country again. How's that working for us? Yeah. Humanly speaking, you can't do that. And we're seeing it play out right in front of it. You can't engineer it. You can't orchestrate it. it human beings cannot orchestrate unity. It's like the fellow said, you can, you can take two cats and tie their tails together and fling them over the clothesline. You have union, but you don't have unity. <laughs> and you can, you can get union, but you may not have unity. Unity doesn't happen on a fleshly level. Unity only happens on a spiritual level. That's when you get the right disposition. You're never, you're never going to get the right disposition and never think alike until we understand the, the spiritual realities of what that means. Listen. God isn't saying get your doctrine together. That's not the issue. He is... He is saying what you need to get together is your attitudes. That's why chapter 4 with the two women, I'm beseeching you to be of the same mind. See, get it, get, get it together. Quit your fussing with each other. Having the right attitude. Be of the same mind. It's, it's, it, it, that's what destroys the work of God. So Paul said you have to think the same way. You have to get your attitudes in perfect harmony. Now, if I'm going to get our attitude right, if I'm going to, we're going to get the same disposition, we're going to understand what the will of the Lord is in that matter, then how does that happen? Well, then we go to the next step. And the next step is Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And that is we have to think spiritually. We have to think spiritually. If we're going to have the right attitudes... We have to learn to think spiritually. Look at Romans 8 with me, will you please? Romans chapter 8. Notice verse 3. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Well, how do I know whether I'm walking after the flesh or walking after the Spirit? Well, verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do what? Mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, it's not mentioned there, but it's implied there, is it not? mind the things of the Spirit. If, I, if I'm after the flesh, you know what I'm doing? I'm minding, I'm thinking after the flesh. If I'm after the Spirit, I'm thinking the things of the Spirit. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. So we have to begin to think spiritually. Those that are, we have to set our mind on the things of the Spirit, not the things of the flesh, not the things of the world, like Philippians 3.19 spoke of. It means you have to begin to have spiritual thoughts. You have to realize the conflict between the flesh and the spirit. These two are 
contrary one to the other. There, there, there's a battle going on there. And they're trying to battle with your thoughts. The Spirit, thinking things of Spirit, takes us out of ourselves. It takes us above our own agenda, our own flesh, our own humanness. Anytime there's a conflict, listen, anytime there's a conflict, it's not between two people that are minding the things of the Spirit. There's always somebody, listen, it's either somebody with the mind of the flesh against somebody with the mind of the Spirit, or it's two people with the mind of the flesh. But when you have two people with the mind of the Spirit, there's no conflict. There's no strife. There's no division as Corinth had. It, 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 you're, you're minding the things of the Spirit. And so when you, when you think spiritually, it means that you're thinking on the things of the Spirit of God. All right, so we said if we're going to be the same mind, then you're going, to, you're going to have to have the same attitude, the same disposition. You're going to have to think spiritually, and you're going to see how that comes about here in just a minute. But that means, look at Romans 12. That means if you're thinking spiritually, if you're thinking by the Spirit, you're going to think humbly. You're going to think humbly. Notice Romans 12 and verse 3. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. It says, I'm saying this to every one of you not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Now just stop and think about that for a minute. It means, that means what are we prone to do? Think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. We're, we're, we're that way. Hey, you just listen to, I, I, just, I chuckle sometimes when they do these post-game interviews. You know, we're in the NCAA tournament and uh, I think one of the dumbest things you ever do is stick a microphone in front of a 19 or 20 year old kid who just played a basketball game and get his, you know, this guy, well, my teammates look to me, you know, and I won't go let them down. You know, I was going to put them on my back. We're going to win this game. There's no way I was going to lose. I thought, really? What a, you know, and, and you realize your team won by one point. And if, if, uh, you know, that guy on the other team, if it had just went the other way, there's some guy on the other team who would be saying the same thing. Ah, they looked to me, and I knew I wasn't going to let our team lose. You know, what an arrogant, you know, they just think of themselves more highly than they ought to think. You see, it's, it's, it, 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 goes, it goes with the human nature. It goes with our pride. And so he says, I want you to, to think humbly, according, soberly, According as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. So we're thinking objectively, not subjectively. We're thinking not with our, uh, with our own mind and about our own selves, but we're thinking, listen, we don't think with our own agenda. We don't think with our own priorities. We're not thinking about our own well-being, our own personal ambitions. That isn't what controls our thinking and controls what we say. We, have, we can't let pride come in and dominate what we think. Let me tell you how that happens. Well, they have no right to talk to me that way. Who are you? Who am I? See how quickly pride can come into our thought process? Remember when David was leaving Jerusalem? Absalom had taken over. Remember a fellow named Shimei came out? What did Shimei do to David? Picked up stones and started throwing them at the king. Dirt and stones and rocks. And you know, the, the, the mighty men of David said, let me take care of him. I think one of them said, I'll hit him once, I won't have to hit him twice. 
basically what he said. David said, let him alone. It may be God wanting to do this to me. Hmm? See? Boy, there's somebody. He's the king. He's still the king. He could have said, cut his head off. Go, go, go smash him to the ground right now. Who is he to do that to me? I'm the king. Hmm? See? But David, you don't think subjectively. You have to think objectively. Romans 15. Romans 15. Verse 5. Now, here's, 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 see, naturally you can't do that. Here's what takes place. Look at verse 5. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be what? Like-minded one toward another According to who? Hmm. Be like-minded, have the same disposition, have the same attitude, have the same concern for one another. God's going to grant that to you, but it's according to who? Jesus Christ. Do we have to bring Christ into the picture? Do we have to bring Jesus into this? Yes. Yeah, He's the standard. He's what we look to. See, we, we, we think the things of the Spirit. We think the things of God. We think the things of Christ. It sounds, sounds simple. It's not so simple. And God has to grant us that. We have to seek that from the Lord. To, lift, to get lifted out of ourselves. Again, conflict is always a result of a sinful attitude. Somebody has a sinful attitude. Two people thinking the things of God, thinking by the Spirit of God, having the right attitude, having the right disposition, thinking spiritual thoughts, not thinking of themselves more highly than they ought to think, don't have conflicts. Don't have schisms. We're to have the mind of Christ. There's always that collision between the mind of the flesh and the mind of the spirit. Following, you know, the, the biggest the biggest process, and 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 this is this is why the Reformers Unanimous program is so successful. You know why? Because it changes your thinking. And your thought processes, you begin to have the same mind as Christ you think differently that's a process and that's why it's not just for the addicts though it is for the addicts it's for every single believer to change their thinking we have we have church members by by the thousands probably by the millions whose thoughts have been shaped by this world and not by God's word. And that's why they struggle with living for God. Because they're not of the same mind. They don't think alike. Now look, we're to have the mind of Christ. Now look at 1 Corinthians. You're in Romans, just keep going to your right there. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Notice what Paul tells them here. Uh, verse number 16. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But look at this last sentence. But we have, what do we have, church? The mind of Christ. There it is again, just like Philippians. I can think the thoughts of Christ. I can have the Christ-like attitude. I can know the will of Christ. I can know the will of God. I can know the will of the Spirit. Hey, I can mind spiritual things, and so can you. I can mind spiritual things. I can think spiritual things. The unsaved man cannot think. They don't mind spiritual things. They mind earthly things. The Bible says so. 
Now, right after he says that we have the mind of Christ, what's the very next verse in Corinthians? I know there's a chapter division there, but if that wasn't there, you'd go right into the next verse. But we have the mind of Christ. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. So if you think about that, I can't speak unto you as unto spiritual. Who's spiritual? Those who have the mind of Christ. See, spiritual isn't the fact you wear a suit to church or you got a haircut. I carry, I carry a King James Bible. Bless God. Not all of those things are right. All those things are good. But don't think because I do that I'm spiritual. See, no, 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 no. Do you have the mind of Christ? Do you think like he does? Do you have the disposition? Do you have the attitude that Jesus did? It says, by your divisions and your jealousies and your, your walking like human beings. You're not walking like spiritual beings. You have the mind of man, not the mind of God, not the mind of Christ, and not the mind of the Spirit. You're fleshly. That's where most Christians live. That's why it's so up and down in their Christian life. He ends 2 Corinthians where we read earlier tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. We read this verse in the preliminaries. When he said, finally, brethren, 2 Corinthians 13, 11, notice he said, finally, brethren, I've got to hurry. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Now, we, we've talked about this before. When he says be perfect, it doesn't, the, the perfection there in the Bible doesn't mean that you're without sin. What, it, what it's referring to is maturity. So he's saying as you, as you get the mind of Christ, as you begin to be of the same mind, it's a matter of maturity. It's a matter of growing. You grow into where you begin to understand how to have the mind of Christ. It's spiritual maturity. When, when you're spiritually immature, you're going to have a lot of back and forth between the mind of the flesh and the mind of the spirit. Okay? And you need to, to grow. You need to mature. How, how do you grow in your Christian life? Well, that leads us to number four, doesn't it? Leads to number four. The Bible says, Desi as newborn babes desire the sincere Milk of the word that you may what? Grow thereby. So the, the fourth thing there is we have to let the word of Christ dwell in us. Now don't leave me now, okay? Stay with it. This is important. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. What you're getting tonight now, this, this isn't just pablum, okay? This is... This is, this is heavy stuff. But you need this. And, and we need this. Be of the same mind. Let, notice what it says in Colossians 3 in verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now listen carefully. What's the word of Christ? When it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, what's the word of Christ? It's the Bible, sure. It's the word of God. You're right. And so he's saying, let that uh, uh, be in you. Now, don't look at me. Don't you look at me and say, oh, pastor, I know the Bible. That's not what it says. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know what the Bible says. That isn't what it says. Did you read what it says? It says, let the word of Christ dwell dwell in you how richly richly is that is that a little bit no richly abundantly let let it be the residing presence let it be the dominant occupant let it be the energizing force of your thoughts the Word of Christ. 
He didn't just say, know the Bible. Why is it that Brother Currington would say that they'd have people come to the discipleship homes who could quote large portions of the Bible by memory and then go out and snort cocaine? Oh, you, you ask them, if you'd had conversation with that person, you said, man, they really know the Bible. But you see, it wasn't the, 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 the dominant resident in their life. It wasn't the, 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 the energizing passion that controlled their thinking. That's what the Bible's supposed to do. Control our thinking. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's when you can think the thoughts of the Spirit. That's when you can have the mind of Christ. That's when you can think mature thoughts and spiritual thoughts. Because you're energized by the indwelling Word of God. It makes all the difference in the world. I don't know, Bob, I don't remember. I think in one of the things that they do for the courts, it lists how many verses they memorize in the RU program. Do you remember at all what ballpark that was in? 800, 800 some verses you, put, you commit and you meditate on and you memorize and you meditate and you make them a part of your life. What's that do? Letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly. No wonder it changes your thinking. You begin to think according to the word of God. And when that happens, when that becomes a part of you and that's the resident, it's Jesus saying, let my words abide in you. That means they live there. That, 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 that it, it, it's such a part of you and a permanent resident of you it controls your thoughts so much so your instincts even are spiritual your reactions will be spiritual because they're dominated by the word of Christ it's not just that you know it it's that it occupies the reigning and compelling area of your life there's no, nothing mystical about it. Nothing magical about it. Just reality. When you let the Word of God dominate you, it'll become the controlling force in your life. You know what it does? It lifts you up out of the world. And you begin to think, like the Bible says, we're seated in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. The songwriter said, I want to live above the world where Satan's darts at me are hurled. See? But when the average Christian will spend 20 hours or 30 hours a week watching television and maybe six hours a week, maybe, reading their Bible or studying their Bible, why do we think we have such a problem thinking spiritual thoughts? See? So many other things that that, 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 that develop and control our thoughts. Did you notice in Colossians 3 when it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, and notice what it says, you'll be teaching and admonishing one another, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Go back to your left to Ephesians chapter 5. Would you look there, please? Are you okay? Ephesians chapter 5. We're almost finished. Ephesians chapter 5. You notice verse 18. Be not drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. What's the result? Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Almost identical to what Colossians 3.16 says. But one is the Word of Christ dwelling in you. This is the Spirit of God dwelling in you. But the results are almost identical. So we find that, that it, it is the, the, the same result in the same thing. 
You'll never be filled with the Spirit if you're not filled with the Word of God. If you want to be filled with the Spirit, fill yourself up with the Word of God. You don't get Spirit-led by just saying, Oh, I want the Spirit of God. Oh, the Spirit of God, help me. Oh, Spirit of God. Let the Word of God dwell in you richly. Holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. This is His book. These are His words. Let them dwell in you richly, and He dwells in you richly. And the results are identical. The results are identical. You're controlling... It. Is the controlling influence in your life the Word of God? By the Spirit of God? Kind of back to the basics, isn't it? But that's how you get to the same mind. When you have a conflict, listen, when you have a conflict, whether it's in church, whether it's at home, it's not usually a conflict over doctrine, and oftentimes it's not even a conflict over principle. Usually, it's a collision or a conflict of attitudes. Somebody isn't thinking spiritual thoughts. Somebody's minding earthly things. That they may be one, Jesus prayed, even as we are one. And I think we are one is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. Is there ever any disagreement in the Trinity? Hmm? Never. Hmm? And like they think, he thinks alike, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, because these three are one. Like he thinks alike, we're to think alike. We're to be of the same mind. One will and one design. And so when there's a conflict or there's a problem, we have to understand it's an attitude problem on my part. It's a fleshly issue on my part. The Bible says we're supposed to be slow to speak and slow to wrath and Quick to hear. Most of us are quick to speak and slow to think and slower to pray and slower to meditate. Slower to search the mind of God. What does God think about this? We just compelled by the flesh. We, I think about and argue all the time that, that what you learn to do is you learn to respond instead of react. You know what the flesh likes to do? React. Somebody pulls out in front of you or somebody cuts you off in traffic. Ah! You know what you're doing? You're reacting. And, and somebody does that, you know what you should do? You should stop and, and just wait a minute. What does God want me to do here? You see, you begin to respond again. I don't, wanna, I don't want the things of this world to shape my reaction. You've heard me say it before. I, I, I had to stop, and I, I, I don't even know now, the last time I listened to some of the talk radio that's on, the, the, the Sean Hannity's, the Rush Limbaugh's, the Glenn Beck's, those type things. You know why? It's affecting my spirit, affecting the way I think. See? And, and, and I didn't want that to happen. And so you have, to, you have to control that, starting with your mind. The unity comes when there's no personal agenda. It, it comes when there's one group of people moving toward one eternal and glorious purpose. And that purpose, by the way, is the glory of God. What is glory of God? Making God look good. 
You know what makes God look good? It makes God look good when he sees his people are of the same mind. When, when we're of the same attitude. When we are thinking spiritual things. When we're thinking humbly. When we're allowing the word of Christ to dwell in us richly. And that is what controls our thinking. It's not a matter of, well, what's your opinion on that? doesn't matter what your opinion is. doesn't matter what my opinion is. It matters what does God say. What does God say about it? That takes care of our thinking. Right there. Unity is always evident in a group of people who are of the same mind. They think alike. And again, it doesn't mean that, that we all like the same furniture. It doesn't mean we're all going to pick the same color chair. Right? It doesn't mean we all uh, have the same tastes and things or the same hobbies that we enjoy. But it means that we all have a knowledge of the Word of God. That it has a prominent place in each of our lives. And that puts us all on the same page. So our, our, our attitudes are the same and our thoughts are the same and we're, we're, we're walking in the Spirit because we're walking in His Word. So we walk in the Spirit. When that happens, we, we not only will have the right mind and we not only think alike, you know what happens then? You love everybody equally. You love everybody equally. I didn't say you like everybody equally. But you love everybody equally. There's no grudges. Nobody gets angry. That's why, do you understand now why the, why the psalmist could say, great peace have they which love thy law and what? Nothing shall offend them. Because when you get hurt, when you get offended, you know what it is? You. Well, that hurt me. Well, wait a minute. If you're dead, how can it hurt? It's evident then you're not dead. You haven't died to yourself. And the word of Christ is not dwelling in you. Pray. Listen, this means we have to be counterculture. It means we're going to be different than the world. Because the world doesn't live this way. We're going to be radically different from the society around us. I'll close with this. Joe, Joe was a drunk who was miraculously converted at the Bowery Mission in New York City. Prior to his conversion, he'd gained the reputation of being a drunk for whom there was no hope. But following his conversion to a new life in Christ, everything changed. Joe became the most caring person anybody associated with the mission ever could remember. There was never anything he was asked to do that he, was con that he considered to be beneath him whether it was cleaning up the mess left by someone who got violently ill, scrubbing toilets in the men's room. Joe did whatever he was asked to do with a smile on his face and gratitude for an opportunity to help. He could be counted on to feed the feeble men who wandered in off the street into the mission and to even undress and get men into bed who were too out of it to take care of themselves. One evening, the director of the mission was delivering his evening evangelistic message to the usual crowd of men with drooped heads. And there was one man who looked up and came down the aisle of the altar. And when he knelt down to pray, he was again crying out to God to help him change for the good. But what he kept shouting at the altar was, Oh God, make me like Joe. Oh God, make me like Joe. 
Make me like Joe. Make me like Joe. And the director went down and leaned over him and said, Son, I think it would be better if you prayed, Make me like Jesus. And with that, he looked up at the director and he said, Is he like Joe? That's a tremendous credit to Joe's faith in Christ. Most people in this day and age, sadly, don't have a clue about Jesus Christ. But they know us. They'll know our mind. They'll know our habits. They'll know our character. And they'll know whether we're serious about following Jesus Christ. Could somebody pray, make me like, and put your name there? And when someone says, well, no, no, you need to be like Jesus, could they say, well, are they like your name? It can only happen if we're of the same mind. Amen? Let's stand together and let's go home, all right? Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for your word tonight. Much to think about. Much for us to ponder this evening. Help us. I'm thinking there in Romans when Paul wrote that God would grant us. Lord, grant us the ability, the grace to be like-minded. To think alike to have the same disposition as Christ, to think spiritual things, to, to mind the things of the Spirit of God who dwells in us, to think humbly, to die to self and to pride, to not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think, and to allow the Word of Christ to dwell in us richly. May it be the dominant resident in our life. May it not be a visitor. May it not be someone we're not very well acquainted with. May it be the energizer of our thoughts. Help us, Lord, to be of the same mind. That the world could see Christ in us. Make us like Joe. Help us to be like-minded one toward another and fulfill your prayer in the garden that night that we'd be one even as you are one. Now, Father, we pray your blessing on each individual as we go our separate ways tonight. Make us mindful you're with us. Help others to see Christ in us this week. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Well, the windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. It's 128 if you need it in the book. And let's sing that together, all right? Here we go. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garment. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven. And that's why I'm happy. That's why you're happy. That's why we're happy tonight. God bless you. You're dismissed. Choir, come right on up for choir practice.